Blood transfusions, what do you need to know for nursing school and the NCLEX? In this video, we're gonna go over blood types, blood compatibility, blood administration, and complications of a transfusion. Now before we get right into it, please remember, we have a blood transfusion study guide inside the Corsetta platform with 1700 plus pages of other study guides in the Corsetta platform membership, where you also get live tutoring from our nursing educators and a virtual reality clinical game to practice your on-demand clinical skills. All right, so let's get right into it. Now in this video, when we talk about blood transfusion, we're talking about packed red blood cells or PRBC. So packed red blood cells are dosed by units. So we have one unit, which is one bag of PRBCs, and it's usually indicated in a hospital setting with a hemoglobin level below seven. All right, so a hemoglobin level below seven is considered an indication for a PRBC. Now, if you guys don't already know, hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen on our red blood cell. So hemoglobin is the lab value that we actually monitor the most to indicate if they need a blood transfusion. So write that down. So when we have determined that a patient needs a blood transfusion, there are things that we need to do, and every hospital system has a systematic process to ensure that it is a safe administration. So first things first, we need to make sure that the blood is going to be compatible with our patient. So there are four blood types. We have A, we have type B, we have type AB, and then we have type O. And also with each one of these types, we have to consider the RH compatibility. So each one of these types could be A positive or A negative and so on and so forth. Before we get into RH compatibility, let's go over the blood compatibilities. So type A is able to donate to type A, of course, and then the type AB. And it's also able to receive from type A, of course, and then type O. And then type B is able to donate to type B, of course, and then AB. And then type B is also able to receive from type B and type O. And then there's type AB, which is considered the universal recipient. So you guys write that down. So AB can receive blood from any type. So A, B, AB, and O. But it is only able to donate to another AB. All right, so then type O is the universal donor. So type O can donate to any blood type. So A, B, A, B, and O. But the downfall is type O is only able to receive blood from another type O. Now the thing you need to know about RH and compatibility is that RH negative blood can only have another RH negative. All right, so then with RH positive, RH positive can have both RH positive and RH negative. So just think, it's positive to have RH positive blood because you can have both types, so you're safe. But with RH negative, it's negative to have RH negative blood because you can only have other RH negative blood. So for example, here we have A positive blood. It's compatible with both positive or negative, so it would be fine with A negative. And then we have A negative blood, but it's only compatible with A negative. It would not be compatible with A positive. Now let's get into the administration of blood. So these are the NCLEX or nursing school facts that you'll need to know to be successful in your exam. So let's go through these four steps. Number one, you wanna confirm the IV catheter. So when we have a unit of blood ordered, we wanna do these four things. But the first step is to confirm that there is an IV catheter that's even allowable for that to happen. You guys wanna write this down. The smallest gauge that is allowed to have blood go through it is a 20 gauge. Because if the IV catheter is too small, it will hemolyze the blood and that will cause issues and even won't provide any benefits for your patient. Now, before you do anything on actually dealing with the blood, you wanna make sure that you're confirming consent. So that is a very common concept they'll ask about is that you need to make sure that you're confirming consent for blood administration. So going on with specifically dealing with the blood, we wanna prepare and prime the tubing. So the tubing must be primed, write this down, the only compatible fluid is normal saline. So 0.9% normal saline, is your only compatible IV fluid that is with blood. So no other IV fluid should be mixed with blood. So number three, confirm the blood and the patient. So this is after you have everything ready, you have the blood in the room with your patient, you wanna confirm the blood with a second nurse. And you also wanna confirm that blood with the patient information. So what you're typically confirming during this time is the blood type, the expiration of that blood, the unit number, the name and date of birth with that patient, the number of units and type of unit that is ordered. All right, and then you wanna confirm also that the type and cross match that was collected to collect the data about their blood and make sure that we're being compatible, well, that has to be within 72 hours of when you're giving that blood. So it can be older than three days of giving that blood. 
So if any inconsistencies, you need to notify the blood bank immediately and return the blood. So that is an intervention that commonly gets questioned about as well. So if you have anything that is questioning the compatibility with your patient, you return that blood and you escalate that up with your physician as well. Now, if everything checks out, of course, the last step, step number four, would to begin the transfusion. So here's what you need to know about doing the transfusion. Hey guys, it's Wilker Patrick, nursing educator in Psych Corsetta. I wanted to let you guys know that I will help you with anything you need at any time if you just send me a text at 940-218-4062, 940-218-4062. Let's get back to the video. We want to, of course, check vital signs immediately before starting and then at 15 minutes after the start of that blood transfusion. Why, you might ask? Because blood transfusion reactions are more likely to happen within that first 15 minutes of giving it. So that is why the nurse also, write this down, has to stay at the bedside for the first 15 minutes. They must not leave the room for that first 15 minutes of the blood administration. So you guys are wanting to write that down for sure. So you do a full set of vital signs because you wanna make sure the temperature doesn't change, the blood pressure doesn't change, the heart rate doesn't change, and the respirations, and of course your oxygenation. Now this is typically according to your hospital policy, but most places want you to check the vital signs every 15 minutes for the first hour, and then monitor every 30 minutes until it's complete. Now when you start a transfusion, you also wanna consider the rate of that transfusion. So we typically give it slower at first, to make sure if they do have a transfusion reaction, we're not you know, 100 mLs deep and we're gonna have a bigger issue or a bigger reaction. So we do start with usually between 50 to 100 mLs an hour. Now you do wanna consider if you have a patient with heart failure where they're more at risk for fluid overload, you wanna start that near the 50 mark because you don't wanna give fluid too fast, especially if they have a transfusion reaction. But once that 15 minutes is up, then you can increase the rate. The typical range is between 100 and 175 mLs an hour, but please, if you're watching this from a hospital, make sure that you are actually going by your hospital policy. So when administering blood, here are the times that you need to know. Four hours. You must administer it within four hours. It cannot last longer than four hours when you start it. 30 minutes. You must start the transfusion within 30 minutes after taking it from the blood banks. So it can't be outside the fridge for more than 30 minutes unless you started it. And then lastly, 15 minutes once again the nurse must stay the first 15 minutes of an administration to monitor for a transfusion reaction. So here are some common facts that the nursing schools and the NCLEX like to ask about. You wanna change the tubing with each unit. This reduces the risk of sepsis. Here's a huge concept. Transfusion reaction, stop the transfusion immediately. The first intervention with a suspected transfusion reaction is to always stop the transfusion and then you wanna keep the vein open by administering normal saline separately from that blood transfusion tubing. Once again, normal saline is the only fluid that is compatible with blood products. So write that down. And then lastly, cross match must be no older than 72 hours. That type and cross match must be collected within that 72 hours of you starting blood. All right, so let's go over complications of a blood administration. So first one is a transfusion reaction. What is a transfusion reaction? A transfusion reaction is a non-therapeutic reaction that is similar to having an allergy to a medication. But the common signs and symptoms for a transfusion reaction is number one, tachycardia, chills and diaphoresis, rashes, hives, itching or swelling, shortness of breath, a cough or wheezing, tingling, numbness, nausea and vomiting. Now you must go by hospital policy with this again, but with the NCLEX, anytime there is an increase in temperature, and decrease or increase in blood pressure or a major increase in heart rate, then that is considered a transfusion reaction as well. So anytime there is vital sign changes, this could be considered a transfusion reaction. So with a transfusion reaction, you're gonna to wanna to write these down. The interventions are super important and they're most commonly questioned about in your nursing exams and the NCLEX. So what is your first step when you have a transfusion reaction? Your first step is to stop the infusion immediately. You wanna change the IV tubing and then start normal saline and that way you can keep the vein open. You wanna notify the healthcare provider and the blood bank, and what do you do with the blood? You return the blood and the tubing to the blood bank so that way it can be tested or evaluated. And you never wanna leave the patient alone during a transfusion reaction. So these are the steps that you would take if you have a patient with transfusion reaction, and this is something that the NCLEX and nursing exam questions really like to ask about, so write these down. Other common complications with blood administration would be circulatory overload. So patients with heart failure are really at risk for this. So it's when the fluids enter circulation too rapidly. So that's why we start at the very beginning lower. 
and then we can increase it after we know the 15 minute mark, after we know that they're doing okay. And then septicemia, so bacteria, when it enters the vascular system, it can cause septicemia, which is common sign of symptoms is a sudden fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, and hypotension or shock. Then we have something called iron overload. So as you know, red blood cells have high contents of iron. So when you give a lot of transfusions, they're at risk for iron overload. So common signs and symptoms would be vomiting, diarrhea, hypotension, bronze skin. All right, guys, that sums up this session. I hope to help you understand blood administration and what you're going to need to know for your nursing exams and the NCLEX. I'll see you guys in the next video. Hey, guys, first of all, thank you so much for watching the video entirely through. It makes our day if we know that nursing school got a little bit easier after watching one of our videos. If you guys like this video, make sure you like it, subscribe to the channel for more, and drop down in the comments for any more ideas that you need help with nursing school. If you want to contact me personally, it's 940-218-4062. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video.